Hello, folks. I'm Josh McGee, and welcome to another episode of the Gateway to Soccer Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, this week marks the 25th episode of the show. So thankful for all the support you have shown me. I'm hoping to continue to improve at this, to continue to make a great show. It's been a lot of fun. I'm hoping to continue to grow it for the time being. But very excited for this week's episode. Got a great guest coming up here. And of course, a lot of great soccer to recap and to discuss. Take a look at the home studio. Got some St. Louis FC and some U.S. Men's National Team gear behind me in honor of my guest this week. And wearing an old MLS for the Lou shirt that was given out during the announcement. And it's going to help tie into what I want to first talk about on this week's episode. Can you believe that this week is roughly the nine-month anniversary of when MLS for the Lou became St. Louis City SC, right up there behind me with the scarf? Uh, it's just kind of really cool to think about how we're almost at the one-year anniversary of that huge reveal, the next chapter of professional soccer here in St. Louis, and how successful it was. Remember when the logo, the crest, and the colors, and the name all came out? It was mostly met with praise. Now, there were some people that were against it, but for the most part, met with praise. And at this point, I feel as though it's pretty much universally accepted that people love the color, love the crest, the deeper meaning behind the crest, right? They put a lot of thought into it. With St. Louis City SC, it was a popular name rec uh, recommendation from fans who wrote in during that suggestion time. So it all worked out pretty well. There was a lot of input from fans, a lot of deeper meaning behind the crest, behind everything that went into it. So that led to a very successful, you know, not so much of a rebrand, but the initial brand of the upcoming expansion club. That, of course, is not the case right now for a lot of teams in MLS. That's what I wanted to start off with this episode talking about. Now, while a brand like St. Louis City SC seems like it's going to last a lifetime, that would go against the recent trend in MLS, which is clubs rebranding their team name and their team crest. It's been happening a few times over the past few years, and it happened again this week, causing even more uproar. After pictures leaked online over the weekend, Columbus Crew SC announced on Monday that they would be rebranding the club's name and club's crest. They would be changing the name from Columbus Crew SC to just Columbus SC, and they would be updating the team crest as well. Club officials called the move a quote-unquote brand evolution and cited the need to elevate Columbus to a grander stage. They're still going to have the crew kind of like they're going to use the name a little bit, but it's just not going to be in the official club name. Again, remember, Columbus crew are one of the founding members of MLS, and this is already their third rebrand. Quite amazing and quite shocking. This kind of came out of nowhere, but apparently this has been in the works for quite some time, but it just came to a head this past week. And of course, the decision was met with a lot of uproar. An overwhelming majority condemned the rebrand. You had a couple of different supporters groups, most notably, of course, the Nordec issuing statements, uh, condemning the move, condemning the changes to the club's name and to the team crest, and revealing that they hadn't really been consulted on the process. That was what they were most mad about, that they weren't consulted on the changes. They were only kind of notified after the things had been put in motion that they were going to happen anyway. They had to sign some type of non-disclosure agreement in order to see the changes early on, and they warned club officials that there would be a huge backlash to the changes, yet they still went ahead with it. And again, they weren't really consulted on the process, and that is what's led to all the outrage, not just the fact that, in my opinion, in a lot of people's opinions, the name change seems unnecessary. The crew is basically what kind of defines that club, kind of makes them stand out across MLS, and of course, the, the club logo. I know they changed it to make it look like the Ohio flag, but it just looks very clip arty. Looks like something out of Paw Patrol, honestly. It just looks very cartoonish. I know it's about the Ohio flag, and they got the C there, but all those clubs, basically, in Columbus, they got so many teams with the C as their logo. You think about the Indians. You think about the Reds. They've got so many different teams already in the state of Ohio that use that C predominantly. Why add the crew in the mix and just make them one of the clubs in Ohio instead of letting them stand out just a little bit? And like I said, this announcement by the crew this week follows a string of rebrands in MLS that have been met with mostly criticism in recent years. Just before this season, you had the Montreal Impact rebrand to Club de Foot Montreal and also changed their logo, which I don't think a lot of fans were too enthused about. The name change kind of makes a lot of sense, obviously, uh, kind of going towards their French roots. And of course, with the team logo, they have certain aspects that are, you know, symbolized in Quebec and with Montreal. But in terms of just the overall display of it, it wasn't really met with too much enthusiasm. Then, of course, you had a little more than a year ago, the Chicago Fire SC changed their name to Chicago Fire FC. Again, what's really the point there? And created a new crest that was met with so much anger, they are currently still in the process of working with fans 
on making a better one. That's supposed to happen here at the end of this season and be ready to go for the 2022 season. But it was so bad and met with so much anger that they have already said, all right, we're going to go away from it. We're going to come up with something new. Uh, again, what is going on with these clubs and these rebrands not consulting with fans and not getting things right? Now, it's one thing for expansion clubs and fairly new clubs to undergo these types of rebrands because you're either trying to figure things out for the first time or you're still trying to figure out your identity within your league. But for two founding members of any sports league to undergo major transformations to their luck and to their name, it's just unheard of here in American sports. What would you think if the Yankees and Red Sox changed their look right now? What if the Cowboys or the Green Bay Packers decided to change their logo and team name? It would be met with such vitriol and such anger that they wouldn't be able to get it done. Fans would completely protest, and it would not happen. Yet here in MLS, it's a pretty popular trend as of right now. It seems like teams are coming up with all sorts of different logos and different names. It just seems very much commonplace, and yet in terms of the history of sports here in America, and of course, obviously, the history of soccer, you just don't go willy-nilly changing your name and crest every few years. Now, on the flip side, historically, there have been a lot of successful rebrands in MLS. Think about the Kansas City Wizards rebranding to Sporting Kansas City, and how much of an improvement made, they made at that club. They won an MLS Cup. You think about the Dallas Burn. Love me a good, you know, old school MLS name, but they rebrand FC Dallas and think about how much success they've had here in MLS under that new team crest and team name. Think about the Colorado Rapids. Didn't undergo a team name change, but updated their logo a little bit and helped improve there. And of course, even the LA Galaxy went away from their original logo, but were able to find a team crest and kind of new team colors that worked. And of course, now one of the most iconic brands in the league. Outside the Galaxy, those types of rebrands were necessary to help upgrade failing clubs and kind of get things going a little bit, create some excitement, and eventually lead them on the path to improvement. The Columbus crew are coming off of an MLS Cup victory. They just displayed that past logo, now in the past that logo, at the CONCACAF Champions League recently on national television for the world to see, pretty much. So they're not necessarily a failing club. They're one of the most successful clubs right now in MLS. So why would you kind of just smash all that momentum that your club has, how much recognizability that they've had over the past few months with these wins, you kind of just throw that all away by completely changing your look. And again, this trend of not involving fans in the process, the people who shell out a ton of money each year to support their clubs, who are there not just in the good seasons, but also during the bad seasons, is incredibly disturbing that their input is not being relied upon during this process. Support culture is what has helped raise MLS to a certain level of respectability on the world football stage, but it's really tough to take a league seriously when its clubs are constantly changing its identity. We already have to put up with, and now this is not just in MLS, this is with soccer as a whole, the jerseys, the kits changing every single year, and people shelling out money each year to buy a new kit. That's an entirely different argument in itself. But to constantly having to deal with, you know, crest changes, with name changes all over these types of years, it just is more and more of a burden on the fans who are just trying to support their club, who are just trying to be there through thick and thin. They have to go deal with this type of stuff, and they don't even have any input, right? They just have to take it. And it, it really is just a tough thing to see right now here in MLS because it has been happening so much frequently here over the past couple of years. At the end of the day, ownership and supporters of these rebrands will say it's just a business decision. One of my least favorite phrases, not just in sports, but in the world. But okay, I'll play that game. Enraging your customers is not a good business model. If MLS wants to continue its ascension, it needs to stop trying to fix things that aren't broke and start fixing some of the problems within the league. But if they must, if a club has to go through a rebrand, please bring in the fans and have them have some input on the decision. They're the ones who are going to be displaying that crest all over the world at all of your matches representing you during the highest points and at the lowest points. They want to be wearing something that they can be proud of that represents them, that represents the club, the city, etc. Bring them in, help figure things out. I guarantee you things will not be not met with this much backlash like we've seen in Columbus, like we've seen in Chicago, Montreal, and over the course of history here in MLS. If that's going to continue, if these clubs are just going to stick with the business side of things, bring in these marketing firms to help figure out all these new logos and team names that nobody really wants, we're going to get further and further away of what makes soccer great here in this country. Okay, so with no Champions League for the next couple of weeks, I thought we'd jump right into an update on the big five leagues in Europe as they wind down their domestic seasons. Let's start in the English Premier League. After the 2-1 loss in midweek by Manchester United to Leicester City, 
Manchester City clinched their seventh league title overall and third Premier League title under Pep Guardiola. After getting off to their worst start since the 2008-2009 season, Man City rallied starting in November and rose quickly to the top of the table, winning 22 of their next 27 matches after he lost to Tottenham, including a 15-match winning streak. City, most dominant team in the EPL and quite possibly in all of Europe, if they're able to win the Champions League in a couple of weeks. Marked by that defense, I definitely think that Ruben Diaz is the player of the year in the Premier League. He's basically been City's version of Virgil van Dijk, has completely transformed that defense, basically replaced what Vincent Company gave to the club a few years ago. But of course, they got so many great offensive weapons. They didn't even really have Sergio Aguero this season. They still managed to put in a lot of goals. Kevin De Bruyne still doing his thing. The emergence of Phil Foden as a powerhouse has also been a huge get for City. They've wrapped up the title. We also know the three clubs who are going to be relegated. That would be Fulham, West Brom, and Sheffield United. So the only thing left to play for is those remaining Champions League spots and Europa League spots. You got the likes of Chelsea, Liverpool, Leicester City, maybe even West Ham United in the mix as well. We saw in midweek Chelsea drop a 1-0 decision to Arsenal, which could set them back. They got a lot of focus on this month with the FA Cup final tomorrow and with the Champions League final here in a couple of weeks. So they're going to be quite occupied. You got Liverpool trying to figure things out. Should be an entertaining race there in the English Premier League here to wrap up the season. Moving on to talk La Liga and in another stunning twist in the title race there in Spain, both Real Madrid and Barcelona dropped points over the course of this past week, while Atletico Madrid were able to pick up the full three points in a 2-1 to one win versus Real Sociedad. Real Madrid needed a late equalizer from Eden Azar deep into stoppage time to salvage a 2-2 two two draw versus Sevilla FC, who are still in the title race thanks to a midweek victory over Valencia, while Barcelona took a 2-0 lead into halftime but somehow conceded three goals and had to settle for a 3-3 draw versus Levante following that 0-0 draw versus Atletico Madrid last Saturday. Going into this weekend, Atletico hold a four-point lead over Barcelona with two matches to play. Now, Real Madrid, they had a match on Thursday versus Granada. Didn't finish in time to make this taping, so I'm going to scroll the score down below. At best, with the win, Real Madrid would be two points behind their rivals, Atletico, in first place. At the end of the day, it's in Atletico's hands, right? If they just win their last two matches, they will be La Liga champions. It would be quite the accomplishment for them to hold off both Real Madrid and Barcelona, who've been coming on strong the past few months. But lately, both these clubs have just had a hard time playing defense a hard time holding on to leads, especially with Barcelona. It's just incredible to think that with the 2-0 lead, all that they have to play for, that they would completely, you know, change some personnel, change some tactics in the second half, and just let up a huge offensive onslaught to Levante, who were able to come back and get that draw. Doesn't make any sense. Ronald Koeman, I mean, he's got to be on very thin ice if he's not able to finish the job here and win La Liga. Uh, with Real Madrid, again, it was a tough match versus Sevilla, but they still needed to come up with that win. And if it wasn't for Azard very late on, they would have lost that match and would have made things a lot more harder here at the end of the season. So again, as of this right now, Atletico, they don't have to play very tough opponents. I got to think that they're going to find a way to get things done with that defensive system, keep teams off the board, and find a win way to win La Liga here at the end of the season. So, But still, very close, very tight. Should be a very interesting final few weeks here in La Liga. Next up, let's talk about the German Bundesliga and a thrilling contest between two top clubs. Jaden Sancho's second goal of the match in the 87th minute proved to be the winner as Borussia Dortmund were able to beat second place RB Leipzig 3-2. The win elevated Dortmund into fourth place where they lead over Eintracht Frankfurt by one point. An important victory there by Dortmund. Sancho coming up huge with, I believe, Allen was on the bench for this due to injury. So, Great performance by him, able to pick up the full three points against a top club in Germany there in a huge dogfight for that final Champions League spot with Eintracht Frankfurt with just a couple matches to play. But this was the biggest test for Dortmund. They were able to pass it, so we'll see if they're able to complete the season and take that Champions League spot, which would be huge in their efforts to keep Sancho and Allen for next season. With Leipzig's loss to Dortmund this past weekend, it meant that Bayern Munich officially clinched their ninth straight Bundesliga title, and they proceeded to celebrate in style with a 6-0 beatdown of Borussia Mönchengladbach. Robert Lewandowski scored a hat-trick in that match, which took him to 39 goals on the season, which means he is just one goal behind Gerd Müller's single-season goal-scoring record of 40. So it would be an incredible accomplishment for Lewandowski to break that goal-scoring record. He's got two matches left to do it, but Bayern Munich wrap up yet another Bundesliga title 
They've got quite the stranglehold of that country right now, what they've been able to do, even with the drama kind of going on behind the scenes, with Hansi Flick set to leave at the end of the season, the fact that they didn't win the Champions League here this season. So there's some disappointment, but still able to dominate Germany once again. So much talent. We'll have to see here if Lewandowski can break the record. Moving on to Serie A, after getting a penalty just before the halftime whistle, AC Milan got goals from Antti Rebic and Fikeo Tomori late on to beat Juventus 3-0 in Turin. Both clubs picked up a victory in midweek, as did Napoli, who currently sit one point ahead of Juventus in fourth place. So it's incredible to think that this late on in the season, there's real doubt as to possibly Juventus and Cristiano Ronaldo playing in the Champions League next year. They got to go up against the recently crowned champions, Inter Milan, this weekend, a very tall task. While the other clubs, you know, Napoli, AC Milan, Atalanta, have other matches against weaker opponents. So it's going to be a tough task for Ronaldo and co. to make it to the Champions League next season. You got to think that Andrea Pirlo could be out the door, as could Cristiano Ronaldo. I mean, why would you want to play for a non-Champions League club if you're Ronaldo at this point in your career? So a lot to play for here over these next couple weeks. That's a big game to watch out for this weekend, Juventus versus Inter Milan. See if Juve can somehow call their way back into the Champions League picture in Serie A. And lastly, in League One in France, we are on the verge of crowning new champions as PSG suffered a major setback to their title defense, dropping points in a 1-1 draw versus Stade this past weekend. The draw leaves them three points behind the current leaders, Lille, with two matches to play as Lille successfully beat Lens 3-0 this past Friday. So, very close to crowning new champions in France. PSG have been winning that title these past few years, but Lille have had a very impressive season. They've gone head-to-head quite well with PSG this year. And yeah, too many slip-ups recently. Obviously, PSG getting knocked out of the Champions League kind of puts a damper on some things. They've had a few injuries, but still, they definitely had the talent, and they should have been able to pull away here with another league title. But I would have to assume Lille should be able to take care of business here with just two matches left to play and be crowned new league champions in France. So I want to move on and talk a little bit about MLS. They're coming off of a great week in the league. This past weekend, we had three nationally televised matches, two on ABC and one in primetime on Fox, as well as some other great matchups. So I wanted to give my top five results from MLS this past weekend. There were a lot of fixtures midweek this week, but I wanted to focus on those matches from this last weekend, but I'll throw in a few results from midweek to add some context. So starting off at number five, after three consecutive draws to start the season, Nashville SC picked up their first victory of the year with a 2-0 win versus the New England Revolution. Nashville are one of three clubs currently in MLS who have not lost so far this season. So Nashville, they're having a little bit of trouble getting over the hump. They were either unable to score or they were unable to hold a lead late on in their matches, but they put it all together here and come up with the victory. Another clean sheet for St. Louis native and goalkeeper Joe Willis. Of course, that defense has been pretty good so far this season, led by the reigning defensive player of the year, Walker Zimmerman. But Nashville finally able to put it together here and pick up a win against a quality opponent in New England. So we'll have to see going forward if Nashville can kind of string some things together. Yeah, obviously the three draws, you'd like to do better there, but they haven't lost. And that's something to be celebrated here early on in the season. Next up at number four, Atlanta United FC's Joseph Martinez scored his first goal since returning from his ACL injury that basically cost him the entire 2020 season. But it wasn't enough as Inter Miami CF got a late equalizer from Lewis Morgan. That was enough to secure a 1-1 draw. Both clubs sit on five points to begin the season, with Miami dropping a result to CF Montreal in midweek. So Miami, it's been interesting to see them so far this season. They've really been grinding things out. They've been a tough out for their opponents. This was one of the nationally televised games on ABC from this past weekend. But unfortunately, that momentum kind of got halted in midweek versus Montreal. But it's been interesting to see how things have been going there with new head coach Phil Neville on Atlanta's side. Good to see Joseph Martinez get that goal. He looks like he's starting to find his form, starting to find his fitness. Obviously, it's been tough coming off of that ACL injury, but just really cool to see him back scoring goals. So interesting match between two clubs down there in the Southeast, and we'll have to see how things develop here going forward. Moving on to number three, it looked like Minnesota United FC were on their way to their first victory of the season after they took a 2-0 lead into halftime, but Colorado Rapids came storming back in the second half and ultimately won the match 3-2. to two. Emmanuel Reynoso got his first goal of the season for Minnesota, but it was to no avail. Thankfully, for their sake at least, in midweek, they were able to pick up that first win of the season with a 1-0 victory over Vancouver. Regardless, 
Definitely think that Minnesota are still in a lot of trouble. This was a very concerning development. They had that nice little lead there and just getting run over in the second half by the Rapids was very concerning. Obviously, they stopped the bleeding in midweek, but I definitely think Adrian Heath is on the hot seat there in Minnesota. They had huge expectations before the season, and they just have not gotten things going. Like I've been saying, the defense has kind of reverted back to some of the problems that they had when they initially joined MLS, and the offense finally seems like things have kind of gotten going. You got Reynoso on the board. Uh, one of the strikers, I believe, scored in midweek, which is really important. But still, a lot of problems there in Minnesota, a lot of warning signs. And if things kind of continue like they did versus Colorado, definitely could see Heath getting sacked and things changing up there in Minnesota. Up next at number two is that nationally televised primetime match on Fox this past Saturday. Javier Chitarito Hernandez scored a goal and assisted on the winner as the LA Galaxy were able to beat their El Tráfico rivals LAFC by a score of 2-1. to one. LAFC were still without Carlos Vela, but they got an equalizing goal from Diego Rossi in the second half before the Galaxy's Jonathan Dos Santos eventually scored the game-winning goal. Very impressive performance by the Galaxy. Chitarito playing like an MVP candidate at the moment, leading the entire league in goal score. With LAFC, still tough to judge them right now with the absence of Carlos Vela, but the defense, they just let the Galaxy a little too much into their box as the match continued to go on and here suffer another late loss. I think at this point, the Galaxy are for real. It seems like they've found a way back. And of course, Chicharito has really rediscovered his form here in MLS after that disappointing first season. So very entertaining match. The latest rendition of El Trafico didn't disappoint. And yeah, even more momentum for the Galaxy here early on in the season. But my number one result in MLS from this past weekend has to be because of what went down in the second half. In a stunning turn of events, Portland Timbers' Diego Valeri missed two penalty kick attempts before Seattle Sounders' FC4 Raul Ruiz Diaz stepped up to convert his as Seattle beat their Cascadia rivals 2-1 to one in Portland. Valeri's first attempt was stopped by goalkeeper Stefan Fry before VAR intervened and the referee judged that Fry had come off his line a little too early. Valeri's second attempt clanged off the post. He was able to put the rebound in, but it didn't count because no other player touched the ball first. Valeri is one of the most reliable penalty kick takers in all of MLS, so this was extremely shocking to see. And, of course, Seattle were able to utilize that momentum and shove it right back in Portland's face and end up winning this match. Freddie Montero got on the scoreboard late to make it 2-0 before a beautiful free kick there by Portland at the end was able to salvage that goal, but not the three points. Again, just a stunning turn of events that Valeri missed these two attempts. And, again, even on the replay with VAR, it kind of showed that Fry didn't really leave his line. He was kind of hovering above it. So I'm not sure about the call, but still, things broke Seattle's way, and they continue their impressive start to the season. This was the other big match shown on Mother's Day, Sunday afternoon on ABC. The Seattle were able to come up once again with a huge win over their rivals. So it was a very impressive weekend in MLS, a lot of big matches, a lot of big results. And yeah, it just kind of adds to the excitement and to the depth of the league. And we'll see if we can continue this momentum forward into the coming weeks. Before I jump into some women's soccer, just kind of looking at this weekend slate for MLS, a lot of interesting matchups coming up here. Give me something like Philadelphia Union versus New York Red Bulls. You also got on Sunday, Columbus Crew. In my opinion, still the crew. SC versus New England Revolution. You got LA Galaxy versus Austin FC on Saturday. And also, of course, the big matchup once again, Sunday night, you got the Seattle Sounders FC versus LAFC. So again, another great weekend slate here for MLS. Now let's jump into some women's soccer. And of course, we got to start off with that incredible NWSL Challenge Cup final. Portland Thorns FC outlasted New Jersey, New York, Gotham FC in a penalty kick shootout to win the second edition of the NWSL Challenge Cup. Portland got on the board early through a beautiful curling strike from Christine Sinclair and almost added a second in the first half when Lindsey Horan stepped up to take a free kick, but her attempt claimed off of the crossbar. Portland dominated that first half, and really dominated the match overall. I believe they outshot Gotham 26-8, to but Gotham were able to get the equalizer in the second half through Carly Lloyd, really great header in the box by her. And of course, they're able to hold on for extra time. Nothing happened there, so the match ended 1-1. We go to a penalty kick shootout. Both clubs had a player hit the crossbar in the shootout, which is very rare. So things were even up basically to that final kick. Adriana French, the goalkeeper for Portland, was able to come up with the save, and then Morgan Weaver stepped up to bury her penalty kick and obviously win the shootout for Portland. This was a very entertaining match. Like I said, I really thought Portland were going to run away with things, especially in that first half, but Gotham were able to hold on. They eventually settled things down in the second half. They were able to get a little bit more possession. 
Lloyd comes up with that equalizing goal. And yeah, like I said, things were very tense from then on out. And of course, we get to the penalty kick shootout. There, of course, has been a long-winded debate about whether or not to finish off a cup final with the penalty kick shootout, but it was very entertaining in this instance. But at the end of the day, I don't think it can be questioned. Portland were the most dominant team at the Challenge Cup. They got so much talent, obviously, but they were able to put it all together on the field. They didn't lose a match at the Challenge Cup. They only drew once with Houston Dash, so I think they're definitely worthy champions here. Some great performances. Again, you got Sinclair still scoring goals there for Portland. And, of course, Adriana French coming up with that huge save in the penalty kick shootout. So, well-deserved, and congrats to Portland on winning the second edition of this tournament. Now we have to flip the page to the next part of the NWSL season, which is the regular season. That kicks off this weekend with the two newest clubs in Racing Louisville FC and Kansas City facing off the OL Reign, who have been in the news this past week because they've acquired the services of French international Eugenie Le Sommer and potentially U.S. Women's National Team player Rose Lavelle, if rumors are to be true. This summer, in just a couple weeks' time, once their seasons wrap up, they will be taking on the North Carolina Courage this weekend and Challenge Cup MVP Dabina, which I thought was much deserved for what she was able to do for North Carolina. That's going to be a great matchup, but yeah, think about it. You already got Buhati, the goalkeeper, Morosian, and now Liz Somer coming for the OL ring in terms of the international player. And of course, the rain had acquired the rights to Rose Lavelle in a trade this offseason. If she's able to come back and play for the rain, they're just going to be absolutely loaded. Those matches versus Portland are going to be great and must-see television here this summer. And lastly, of course, another big match, the reigning Challenge Cup champions, Portland Thorns FC, will begin their regular season versus the Chicago Red Stars. That should be a really cool, you know, close match. We'll see if Chicago will be the first club to hang a loss on Portland this season. So, yeah, very excited for the regular season the NWSL to kick off. A lot of storylines. Of course, Portland, can they repeat the success they had in the Challenge Cup and win it all? What about the rain? All the great players that will be coming in this summer. How will they be acclimated? You've got some of those newer clubs like Racing Louisville and Kansas City. They had their first taste of the NWSL. How will that translate to the regular season? And of course, some of those other clubs like Chicago, Houston, uh, Orlando, who kind of only just got going, North Carolina, just got going in the Challenge Cup. We'll see if they can continue on that path and be even more successful here in the regular season. So while I do think Portland have set themselves apart from the group, I definitely think this will be a very entertaining and close NWSL regular season, and we'll see who can get those few 16 playoff spots here by the end. Also in women's soccer coming up this weekend, Chelsea will face off versus Barcelona in the UEFA Women's Champions League final. Both clubs are seeking their first victory in the tournament, having already won their respective domestic leagues. Very excited for this matchup. A lot of offensive talent on the field. You've got Jennifer Hermoso and Leaky Martins on one side for Barcelona. And of course, on the other side, you've got the Golden Boot winner in the FA, you know, Women's Super League with Sam Kerr. You also got Fran Kirby and Pernille Harder over there for Chelsea. So going to be a lot of talent on the field. Expect a very entertaining match. Couple goals for either side. Maybe it goes to extra time. Who knows? But very hopeful that Chelsea can get things done here and cap off a tremendous season. They just wrapped up uh, their domestic league victory. Barcelona had a perfect record in theirs. So again, you're seeing two of the best clubs in the world facing off here in the final. What more could you ask for? All right, let's move on to talk a little bit about the USL Championship. We're coming off of a great weekend slate of fixtures last week. So I want to go through a few of those results that caught my eye. Starting off with a couple of perennial contenders, one from each conference. Phoenix Rising FC beat expansion club Oakland Roots SC 3-0 at home. Solomon Asante got on the scoreboard twice. Elsewhere, the Tampa Bay Rowdies convincingly beat Pittsburgh Riverhounds SC by the same scoreline, 3-0. Sebastian Gunzati got another goal in that match. Both these clubs will be facing off against each other tomorrow on ESPN2. Very exciting because, obviously, they are the reigning conference champions, East and West, but they didn't get to face each other in last year's final due to the pandemic. So we're finally getting that matchup between these two top clubs in the USL Championship. Phoenix off to a great start so far this season. I believe that's seven goals in two matches. So, of course, their offense is flying high. On the other side, with the Tampa Bay Rowdies, same thing. They've got six goals in two matches. So, two of the best offensive clubs in the entire league going up against each other here on ESPN2. So, very excited for that matchup tomorrow night. Looking forward to see how they match up. You can make an early statement here. If you're either one of these clubs, obviously, there's a lot of soccer to be played. 
but I definitely think we could be seeing a potential rematch or preview of the match that we didn't get last year going forward in this year's USL Championship Final. Elsewhere in the Central Division, FC Tulsa maintained their perfect start to the season with a 2-0 win versus Indy 11. Tulsa were actually outshot 16-4 in this match, but they were incredibly patient and efficient when their chances came to them. They currently have a five-point lead at the top of the Central Division over Louisville City FC. Tulsa, man, if you're looking for a team outside of your normal type of contenders this season in the USL Championship, they've got to be on your radar. They just play a tremendous aggressive style of ball. They're scoring a lot of goals, but also the defense, tremendously consistent, been able to keep out their opponents through these matches. They were able to, again, take advantage of their opportunities in this match, and they were able to hold out in the 11 from scoring. So again, great start for Tulsa so far this season. Remember, they had to change conferences. They're in a different division now, but they've gotten off to that great start, maintaining their perfect record, and I can't wait to see what they do the rest of the season. Some other results that caught my eye last weekend in the USL Championship, you had Louisville City FC dropping points in a 1-1 draw versus Birmingham Legion FC. Playing conditions weren't the best, but still very tight contested match between two Midwest clubs. You had rivals El Paso Locomotive and New Mexico United also play to a 1-1 draw, and Hartford Athletic were able to scratch out a close 1-0 win versus the Miami FC. So again, it was a big week like we kind of talked about on last week's episode in the USL Championship. A lot of interesting results. Of course, looking ahead to this weekend, like some of the matches, but of course, it's the big one for me, right? Tampa Bay versus Phoenix, reigning conference champs from both conferences, big clubs. They've been scoring a lot of goals, now going up against each other here on ESPN2. Very excited to see that matchup here this weekend. So before I get to my guests, I want to highlight a couple of St. Louis soccer news stories from this past week. I mentioned FC Tulsa in the last segment, and one specific player scored those two goals in that win versus Indy 11, and that of course would be former St. Louis FC midfielder Joaquin Rivas. He was named USL Championship Player of the Week because of that performance, and he currently leads the league in goal score with four. Joaquin is off to a tremendous start to the season. His playmaking ability has been fantastic, but now, of course, he is putting in the goals. He is leading Tulsa right now through that perfect start. Very impressive, taking his chances, scored a penalty also in this match versus Indy 11. But yeah, he has been the catalyst for what Tulsa has been doing, especially on offense. It's been really cool to see him blossom. Of course, a few years ago, he had a problem with an injury at St. Louis FC. We never really got to see the full aspects of his game. But now, of course, at Tulsa, he is currently thriving. So great start. And congrats to Joaquin to be named Player of the Week. And hopefully he can continue on this form alongside with Tulsa this season. Moving on from that happy story to a sad story. Unfortunately, after their 2-0 loss to Burnley in midweek, St. Louis and Tim Ream and Fulham were relegated from the English Premier League after just one season. Ream has made eight starts so far across all competitions for Fulham this season, including five in the Premier League. So tough break for Ream and Fulham, despite the fact that they're a little bit of a rival to Chelsea. I've always liked Fulham, always liked what they have done for American players. Of course, Craven Cottage is a great stadium, but unfortunately, they're going back down after just one season up here. Once again, goal scoring and defense, both problems. I think initially it was the defense, but over the course of these past two games, it's been the goal scoring. So Who knows what's next for Ream? I know there have been a few people here in St. Louis who would love to have him as a part of St. Louis City SC. He's going to be up there a little bit in age, but who knows what the future could hold. But hoping for Ream, and if he sticks with Fulham, they can come right back up to the Premier League soon. So hopefully a bounce back season next year for Tim Ream and for Fulham. So one of the biggest developments in St. Louis soccer coming up next week is the inaugural season for St. Louis Scott Gallagher in USL League 2. I brought in a guest this week with first-hand knowledge of the club's goals and expectations for the campaign. Hope you enjoy. Well, I'm honored to be joined by this week, the Academy Director for St. Louis, Scott Gallagher, who will be coaching the team that will debut in USL League Two next week. Former head coach of St. Louis FC, Steve Trishu, thank you so much for joining me today. Great, thanks for having me. It's been a while. (laughs) It's been a while. We last talked at the end of the St. Louis FC season last year, at the end of October, I believe. And while it wasn't official at the time, you had mentioned that you were going to take on this job as the academy director. And you talked a lot about the excitement about being a part of what this club has been doing over the course of its history. Talk to me a little bit about these past few months, how things have been going. Yeah, well, you know, as soon as, soon as the, uh, the first team season ended back in October, um, I had already known that I was going to take over that position. So I kind of jumped right into it, uh, you know, just uh, trying to get to know the players, 
get to know the coaches and how they're coaching and, you know, just, just really the whole program. And so, uh, you know, there was a little bit of time of feeling out for it, but, uh, no, as soon as, uh, as soon as the new spring season started back in January, I jumped right into it. And, um, yeah, we're well into our spring season for the MLS next and it's going well. Um, a lot of good players in our club, uh, a lot of good coaching in our club. And so, you know, we're going to continue to keep doing what they've done in the past. Um, and, and really try and make it a little bit better than, than uh, you know, what it previously was. So um, just kind of been working on all that. So obviously, you know, you're going to be coaching this team here in USL League Two, but this role obviously involves a lot more of being a part of the entire academy structure. Of course, you know, it's not at the professional level, which is where you've been coaching. You're uh, coaching now uh, these kids now coming up through the academy. So talk to me a little bit about some of the bigger adjustments that you've had to make with the process, having a more expansive role having to be involved with more things than just coaching and also just the different level that you're dealing with at this role. Yeah. Well, you know, the, obviously the Academy level that I'm, that's my main role is, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of coaching going on. It's really just, just helping out and identifying players and giving, you know, just some, some things here and there that I, that I need that, uh, you know, when, when the, when the USL two team came around, Brad Davis approached me and said, Hey, would you be willing to do this? Um, you know, just kind of around, around the academy schedule. I'm like, for sure, you know, because, you know, I, I do still like coaching. Um, and really what I've been trying to do is try and make it as professional um, for these kids as possible because one of the, one of the pathway for this, for, for us right now, is through this in the professional ranks. And, you know, these, these kids, there, there are a few of them. Um, all, well, actually, all of them have aspirations to play professional, and I want them to, to feel like, you know, if they're going to get to that next level after after their college seasons, once finished and everything, that you know they have a taste of it. And so, what I'm going to try and do these next couple of months here with these guys is, like I said, is, is treat them like professionals, and you know, make the trainings professional as I can, so they do have that uh, you know that taste of what they can expect if they get to that next level. And so, uh, it's it's been it's been really good though. I mean, for the majority of the the um, the roster, it's going to be all kids that have came, come out of the Scott Gallagher program or the SCLFC program academy. And so it's, it's been fantastic. I mean, I've had, <laughs> I've had tons of kids that wanted to play and I think we've put together a decent team. Um, and really I'm just kind of, I'm still waiting for some of them to come in. Some of them are still have finals and um, there are a few that uh, from Indiana that are still involved in the, well, they're in the final four now. And so um, just kind of have to wait for those guys to come in, but uh, we'll get right at it. And um no, but it's been good. Um, like we're going to use some some of our uh, current academy players from the U19 team, um, and it's just it's just giving them a taste of of what that next level can be. So, talk to me a little bit about those conversations about USL League Two. So, obviously, you talked to Brad Davis when it first came up. Were you privy of those conversations before being asked to be a part of the team in terms of Scott Gallagher joining USL League Two? How did this whole situation basically come up? Yeah, well, they, you know, I think uh, the the USL kind of approached uh, approached us because obviously with the first team going from last season, um, you know, and we were actually still looking, we're looking for pathways for our players, and and this is a this is a perfect pathway for these players if, if they want to play at the next level. But yeah, we knew it was coming around, and then you know when everything was finalized, yeah, I wanted I wanted to be a part of it, uh, and so you know, these last uh, whew, probably eight since. Since 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 the, the the team was announced, I've been getting emails and going through players from the, from the from the club and seeing who who wants to play and who has the ability to maybe get it to that that next level. And so, um, you know, put, putting that together and you know, right now it's it's we we, we st just started training this last Monday. Um, it's gone well, and like I said, but there's still there's still probably like ten guys that aren't here yet. Um, hopefully, hopefully they'll be here soon uh, for these next few games coming up. So, again, talk to me a little bit more about the roster here. You've mentioned a few different aspects of it. There are some different rules with this league that allow for certain age groups. You can have a certain amount of players above 23. You have to have a certain amount of players under the age of 18. And like you've talked about, you can pull from a lot of different areas for this roster. I just want to ask a little bit, when it's all said and done, you've got everybody uh, figured out, what are your goals for it? You've talked a little bit about the path to pro. But in terms of figuring out the right pieces and putting it all together, what is your idea behind it? Yeah, well, um, you know, I, I wish I could name names right now, but we still have to go through the registration process with the league until we can announce them. <laughs> but I can give you the schools. <laughs> and so obviously, you know, 
in the, in this area we have same as you siu um you know some of the some of the division two schools that have that we're going to get players from and and really with with the with the SLS, sklfc players that played in the past um or scott gallagher players that have put, played in the past um they're kind of spread out all over the country and so you know i've got a kid there's a player coming from notre dame we've got uh two players coming from South Carolina, one coming from Denver University. And so it's kind of like, like a mission. Well, they're all over the place, I guess. But um, uh, we identified these players. I, you know, I, I, I picked uh, Dale Shilley's mind because he knows all these players in this club. And then the, the past academy coaches that have, that have coached these guys and the past uh, Scott Gallagher elite coaches that have coached these guys to, to try and find the right players and um, trying to fit into the way I want to play. Um, but also, you know, like I said, the majority of these players are going to come from the club. And we wanted to reward these players for, for the years that they've put in. Um, and But also but also finding the, the, the good, the, the top players that have come out of here. And I think we've, we've put that uh, a roster together with that. And um, like I said, it, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be a quick uh, season. There's only 12 games and a lot of games are, you know, only two days apart. And so, you know, I put together probably a roster of, uh, well, right now between 22 and 26 players, and we're going to have to use them all. Um, like I said, some some guys won't be here probably for these next first first few, three games here. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, like I said, the, the players that we're bringing in, I think we're going to have an exciting uh, team. We've played a, a couple uh, um, training matches this week, and the guys have done really well. And so um, I'm looking forward to it. It's just, it's just a matter of uh, – once we get everybody in here, then then um, then hopefully we'll have a really exciting team, yeah. Well, as big of a soccer fans as there are in St. Louis, I'm sure they just need the schools, and I'm sure people can connect the dots as to who might be a part of this team. But that's really cool to see. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure they can, yeah. I mean, and that, there are a couple of players that, that didn't play in the club that um, that some coaches around the country have reached out to me. Um, I will say, you know, one of, one of the players actually played with the, the, the Lions last, last year, and um, – you know the, the coaching staff there kind of pushed pushed him on to me, and so um, no, I, like I said, it's they're, it's a good quality team. Most of most of the kids are not, you know, they're you know freshman, sophomore, under twenty three. There might be a couple kids that maybe twenty four, maybe maybe that's about it. But um, we're like I said, we're we're looking for the players from our club that uh, that uh, want that want and can get to that next level. And I, like I said, I feel a bunch of these guys can. Um, They've had successful college seasons, um, and so you know, like I said, putting putting this together, is, it's been kind of easy. But it's just trying to find a, a balance on the on the um, on the roster because you know most of them were, were a lot of defenders <laughs> when I was first putting this together, and um, I was trying to go out and find attacking players from the club and everything. So, but it, it's worked out. And like I said, um, it's it's been fun kind of putting this together, and uh, it should be a quality team. So some people you can talk about by name and talk a little bit more in depth about is the rest of your coaching staff. Uh, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Louis Swisher here over the past few months of this year and all that he's been doing with the academy already. The rest of the coaches you have some previous experience working with before. What do they bring to the table? Where do they help you out the most here uh, with your work? Well, yeah, for sure, Luis. I mean, he's been coaching the, the U19s these last few years and, and, and has done a great job. And you know, he, he knows a lot of these players. So, like, I had to pick his brain a little bit to to see, uh, you know, because I would get names and I, I didn't know all these kids. And so uh, I had to pick his brain on that and, you know, him trying to help me put the roster together. But then, um, you know, we're, we're, we're utilizing a lot of the uh, academy guys, the academy coaches that, uh, that, are, that are coaching academy. And, you know, Timmy Leonard, I wanted him for sure on there because he, had, he was assistant for the USL championship team for you know what two three years i believe and so i wanted his experience from the sideline in, in, in that level um tim kelly you know obviously he's our goalkeeper coach director and uh he'll be he'll be there um ian ian henry he, he's coaching our u17 academy team right now and he's been involved in the college game and so he, he's been a great, great resource for me and so um you know th th we're still going to have those they'll either be a lot of a lot of a lot of coaches out there like brad davis is going to come out and help dale shilley is going to come out and help at times and so because i i still have another job to do so there, there are times that uh you know i'm going to be busy with that but you know it's, it's like a whole club thing here um and you know we're even trying to include uh some of the elite coaches that have coached some of these guys too so you know like i said it's, it's a club thing right now and it's a great thing for the club and um 
you know, it, it, all these kids, they just didn't play in the academy. A lot of them had, you know, a lot of them wanted to play high school, so they played on the elite teams, but they're still quality players. And so, you know, like I said, it, it, it's been fun trying to put this thing together, and um, we're just looking forward to that first game on Tuesday. Yep, like you said, first match of the season's coming up on Tuesday. You guys actually play a few matches next week. First couple are against Des Moines. Also in your division, you got a first-year team in FC Wichita. There are clubs from Green Bay, Chicago, Peoria as well. I know it's not the same as scouting, you know, you know, USL championship clubs and the resources you have for that, but in terms of expectations of your competition this season, what are you guys expecting in your first year in USL League 2? Yeah, that's a good question. I've been trying to find some some information on all these all the teams in there, um, especially Des Moines. They they actually play this weekend at, at home up in Iowa, so I'm trying to find someone to at least give me an idea of how they play. But a lot of this a lot of this uh, this league is really going to be about what we're going to do. And you know, I'd like to I'd like to have these guys prepared as well as when I when I had the championship, and then you know I can watch video on all these players, all the teams. But right now, there's really nothing out there, and so. Um, we just got to be prepared for anything, um, and that's what, you know, it, 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 it's been kind of interesting just putting the, the team together and getting them together for like a week, and then we're going to start training. Um, but like I said, we played a couple matches this week and didn't really, um, you know, we, we haven't really talked about tactics or how we're going to play, but, um, you know, just trying to simplify the game at this point, make, make sure we're organized, and the, the guys have done well. Um, and so, like I, like I said, um, we're just going to kind of, refine everything these refine the, the the way we want to play these last few days here and until we play on tuesday but really it's going to be like hey guys let's go play let's go let's go fight hard and, and uh try and get a try and get a result out of it so of course you guys will be playing your home matches at the soccer park a lot of great memories there and of course in terms of soccer around here in st louis i think fans are looking for some type of live soccer uh during this kind of break period as we wait for st louis city sc and some of the other clubs around here in terms of the environment at these matches, are you hopeful of anything specific? Or for fans that are interested in learning more about the club or coming out, uh, what should they expect? Well, yeah, I believe they're not charging. And so um, I, I did see, I think, uh, some, something that the Luligans are going to come out and sit in the corner. Um, but, no, it's going to be open. Um, and, I, you know, people, I, hopefully people will come out and watch and enjoy it. You know, I mean, things are – Things are just starting to loosen up now. Um, you know, we, there, we've had a lot of a lot of games out at the soccer park with the youth, and it seems like everything's going well out there. You know, people are people are being good. <laughs> there, there, a lot of people are wearing their masks out there still and social distancing. But um, you know, I want people to come out and have a good time. And and it, it's been a while. You know, uh, obviously, great memories from that last uh, the last game we played here when we when we had to win the game. <laughs> And, you know, I, it's not going to be at that level, but, but still, I mean, come out and enjoy it. You know, I mean, there's not been a lot of, uh, you know, it's not the highest level, but at least at, at least a high level of, of play in, in around the St. Louis area in a, in a while. And so I'm just hoping that people come out and support the team, support the guys, um, and, and support the club because, uh, you know, uh, they've done a, you know, we didn't have to do this, this team, um, but uh, I, I know people – all over the place and especially people within our club wanted this thing. And, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to put a good, good product on the field and then make it exciting for the fans. And um, yeah, hopefully we can win some games and uh, people can enjoy themselves. Well, coach, I want to get you out of here on this a little bit of a fun question. Speaking of St. Louis FC, obviously it's tough, you know, the team uh, folding and not being in action anymore, mm -hmm. but those players have moved on and they've had quite success to start some of the seasons. I know Joaquin Rivas was just named player of the week in the USL championship. Some of the other guys have started out well for their new clubs. I just wanted to ask if you'd been following anybody in particular, if you had any contact with any former players in terms of what you've been doing so far to start their seasons. Oh, yeah. I've talked to a bunch of them. Um, you know, there, there were a lot of teams um, leading up to this season that called me and were asking, and that was asking my opinion on a lot of the players. And I was glad to see, I mean, shoot, I don't know how many guys ended up getting on teams, but the majority of the, you know, the players got on another team. And, and that just goes to tell us that these guys were quality players. And, you know, not just quality players, but they worked hard. Um, they did the right things. And, you know, I, I wish I wished them all success. And I'm, I'm just glad that they're, they found spots where they can play. Um, because, you know, last year was it was a tough year finding out so early and, um, you know, not, not really knowing what was going to happen after, after the season. But, uh, like I said, I had – tons of coaches call about all the players and 
uh, there was nothing bad I had I could say about any of them. I mean, they I, I had to push most of these players, you know, and I just had good things to say about them. So um, I'm just glad that they they hooked up, and hopefully they'll all, all have success. That is very cool to hear. Well, thank you, Coach. Thank you so much for joining yep. me on this show. Again, uh, St. Louis Scott Gallagher making their debut in USL League 2 next week. They'll be taking on the Des Moines Menace out there at the soccer park on Tuesday night. Coach, looking forward to this season. Want to wish you good luck. Again, thank you for joining me on the show. Cool. Appreciate it. Come on out and watch us. My thanks to Coach Trishu for joining me on the show. That'll do it for this episode of the Gateway to Soccer Show. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel, especially comment. would love to hear from people what you're interested in, your thoughts on certain issues that I've brought up on this episode, and, of course, stuff that is going on in soccer. Very excited to get out to the soccer park next week for St. Louis Scott Gallagher's debut in USL League 2. Hope to bring you all some reaction, some analysis from those first few matches. But, again, very excited. Another great weekend slate of soccer. And, of course, I'll be right back here next week with a brand-new episode. So, enjoy all the soccer. Can't wait to be speaking with you all next week. Have a good weekend.